Raj and I are co-chairing this session. We actually work together in London and Mayfair. And today we will be talking, or the, this is the agenda for today. Do you want to speak? Uh, sure. <laughs> so um, basically we are going to try and allow some time to make it interactive and Q&As. Uh, we have Patrick Treacy, who's going to be talking to us about dermal filler blindness and the current uh, latest literature. We then have a great introduction from uh, all the way from the US, which is pre-recorded by David Sullivan, who is the co-director of the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society. That's a publication um, that's hugely important for ocular surface disease, Jews, all of the dry eye uh, publications. But we're going to be speaking about with Amy, um, the TFOS Lifestyle Report, and particularly looking at cosmetics. So Amy Gallant-Sullivan is the other co-director of TFOS, and she's going to be speaking about cosmetics in the eye of the storm. And Jonathan and I are going to finish with a discussion relating to how we can optimize the ocular surface and the adnexy with new innovations in ocular plastics. So we're, I'm just briefly going to introduce uh, Patrick. If we could get uh, Dr. Tracy's slides up, please. So Patrick is a leading global aesthetic uh, authority. He trained as a general practitioner, but he had a very unfortunate needle stick injury in 1986-87 with somebody who was HIV positive, and that caused him to entirely change his life. And he started working in places like Australia as a flying doctor. He went and worked in Iraq. He has practiced in uh, Africa. He has been all over the world, and he's been voted the top aesthetic doctor a few years in a row, including most recently, I think, in 2022. So he's uh, one of the first people to have used hyaluronidase to treat filler blindness, and he's a global expert in that and sits on all the major uh, boards like the IMCAS, if you know what that is. And uh, so. Uh, Patrick was also, he'll, he'll probably blush when I say this, but he was also Michael Jackson's aesthetic physician, but he wasn't responsible for any of the bad stuff, only the good stuff. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you for that introduction. He forgot to mention, of course, that I never seroconverted because it was the days before antiretroviral drugs and I went to theatre and I cut out a big lump of my leg and that probably saved my life. So, um, it's not on the monitor, but we can go here. That's fine. So, that's... Oh, here we go. That's my background, who, who I am. Hello. <coughs> my name is Dr. David Sullivan. Sorry, this I is that. I'm the organizer of the most recent... Uh, Professor Sullivan of Harvard will be speaking after Dr. Tracy. Thank you. So, I'm going to look at dermatofilar blindness, where we are and um, the history of where we have reached there. I, I'm slightly taking sides in this argument, but I'll show you the history um, of my attitude for the last 20 years. So blindness, as we know, is a rare but serious complication that occur when any dermal filler is injected into a blood vessel. There's nothing new about this. We had dermal filler blindness 20, 40 years ago. It was from fat emboli, silicone, from different methods that we were using. So when hyaluronic acid came out, um, and we started using it in the last century, 96, 97, we thought that um, this would be a bit of a breakthrough. I was working in the States as well, and we didn't use it in the United States probably until about 2005 due to FDA regulations. I gave a lecture at FACE in London 2004, advocated the use of hyaluronidase, and um, as Jonathan says, I, I got an award recently for being, if not the first, among the first to use hyaluronidase, not just for reversal of vascular occlusion, but for um, removing hyaluronic acid fillers. The interesting thing was that a few years later in the other side, Jonathan, you're not used to an iPhone now? Eh? I'll do it for you. I see, okay, thanks. In 2007, I advocated that we need to be careful also with hyaluronic acid fillers because they would possibly cause blindness um, like all the other fillers did before them. This is the first patient that allowed her photographs to be used on social media. She's Julie Bass, a nurse from Redwood in California, and um, that was Julie. And that's her in Dublin many years later with her husband who's a plastic surgeon. And um, 
she was among the first that was recorded. These are some papers that I wrote on um, ischemia and um, necrosis uh, and methods to reverse them at that stage. I was president of RSM for a while there in their aesthetics faculty and um, we um, had a meeting each year on um, aesthetic medicine and complications. And in 2012, we had the first case of blindness, you see there, from uh, Lucy Clancy, who's a colleague in London. And she had caused this by using Sculptra. Then um, a colleague of your own, June Carruthers, a famous ophthalmic surgeon in Vancouver, had assembled all the known cases of blindness and there were over 240 at that stage and um, she had advocated in her own words that retrobulbar hyaluronidase should be used as an exit scenario in these patients. You're well used to doing this. This is the retrobulbar technique. Is there sound with that? It doesn't matter if there isn't, I can get by. So um, I had um, said at that stage when the retrobulba was introduced that um, as a means of a rescue mechanism for a patient potentially going blind, that it probably was complicated, it would require a skill set, and it possibly wouldn't work in the first place. So. In that magazine, I said I had expressed my, uh, in my opinion that we should be using the superorbital route instead. My main reason for suggesting this was the risks were high, vision rescue was unlikely as the central retinal artery once inside the nerve where the embolus may be lodged is covered with three layers of meninges and located very posteriorly in the retrobulbar space. I had advocated the use of the superorbital method there's no sound, but it doesn't matter. Back in 2007, and then I had written some, I suppose, papers on that, saying that it's an easy route to, um, to use, and the procedure can be learned very, very quickly and very easily. And I advocated, I suppose, that if a GP had a heart attack in his surgery, and there's a certain amount of time to work, he wouldn't tend to send the patient to a cardiologist for some interventional means. So that if you've got a similar analogy, if a patient's losing their sight with an embolus in their retinal artery, then something should be done pretty fast before an ophthalmic surgeon would see the patient, which would probably be, you know, in Dublin, London, or Birmingham traffic, maybe at least 30 to 40 minutes later. So um, I had um, proposed a superorbital foramen, I know some people in this room agreed with me, and um, we um, had brought it to debate in 2015 at IMCAS, and um, I had written a letter to Prime at that stage as well, advocating the technique, and um, I suppose in 2015 we were with the two methods, one superorbital, the other retrobulbar. Superorbital method has almost a direct route back it's very easy to palpate. It's very easy to um, make contact anatomically, and it requires no special skill set. And again, that was me, I suppose, in Las Vegas 2011, proposing it. And um, interestingly, at that meeting as well, or the meeting afterwards, one of the problems we had with our American colleagues was that we were advocating that probably 1,500 units of hyaluronidase should be used, and they were just used to using 150. So I couldn't figure this out for quite a while because we always used doses that were 10 times that. And then I was told that they're, because they're using Hyalinex, which is the genetic form, they would have to use 10 ampules and they wouldn't even have that on site. So myself, Stephen Dion, Claudia Lorenzo, Corey Mass, Neil Sadek came together for an um, expert panel recommending that the higher doses should be used and Claudia Lorenzo a year or two later wrote a paper on that that's widely accepted. 
In 2016, we had the first case of reversal of potential blindness from um, Geelong Peninsula outside Melbourne by Greg Goodman and Michael Clagg. That's myself with Michael um, after they published that paper. And um, the proposal was to use 300, 350 units to inject back along the route. And I had mentioned that Abu Dhabi. And then all these papers started coming out 2019 um, advocating that there was no evidence that the retrobulbar technique had worked in anybody. So there was lots of papers and they all came to the same conclusion that um, despite it sort of being used in quite a number of cases, there was no evidence to support its use. And then the Chinese, I suppose, who make a lot of pretty good papers this way as well, had said that it shouldn't be used as an effective rescue treatment because um, there was no patients demonstrated to have any recanalization or visual acuity improvement after the treatment. So there's lots of those papers. That's one of our last meetings in the Royal College, um, again with uh, accidents to aesthetic medicine. The patient on the right of me has uh, her forehead half face transplant after she got, I suppose, silicone injected in. The other patient actually isn't an aesthetic complication. She was in a complication from um, necrotizing fasciitis. She's from Newcastle. Then we had the Carolina Institute. She only had 0.2 mils injected by an ENT surgeon um, into the dorsal hump. And um, she had already gone blind. And we had a situation where they couldn't find her embolus, but they thought it was a cavernous sinus thrombosis. And we know from pediatric medicine, when kids get diabetes and they get an infection, they can go blind from um, thrombosis in that region. So it assumed it was there. So um, I was looking at this and I said, okay, we've got a patient who's already blind. The case was given to me a week or two later. And um, one of our colleagues here, Diego Carrera, had worked on using stem cells for to reverse some organ failure. So we met in Mexico and we were going to use stem cells on her. Now I'd used them as well with a technique. Um, I was up for this. Now this patient at the same time, unfortunately, was in Miami <coughs> and she had it reversed and the doctor wanted to take our case. Well, actually, we were, I didn't want him to have it because I discovered that this patient had multiple sclerosis. It was a totally different case. So she probably would have relapsed and remitted anyway. So it became a bit awkward then. So then we had Alex Scoopin, who actually was doing um, stem cells to cranial function, let's put it that way. They were using it for multiple sclerosis, they were using it for a lot of things. And I had met him in, again, South America, and um, we were going to do it, but they wouldn't allow him to do it in Miami, so we were going to the Dominican Republic. So we had the patient all scheduled for it, and this is a doctor who was doing tracheal implants, who we had at the Royal Society of Medicine, and he was working at the Caroline Institute, and unfortunately, he did some improper research and gave failed results. Three of his patients had died and he hadn't um, revealed that. So then the Caroline Institute, because of that, pulled out and they decided that, okay, this patient's not going anywhere, which is fair enough. So then that's where things sat until 2021. And I had proposed that IMCAS is there a role now for the hyaluronic acid at all? Raki was here, had said, the risks are high, vision is unlikely and more likely to be reversed with subcutaneous periocular, which was the same as we were saying. And then Stephen Weiner had said there's only five millimeters or less of the ophthalmic artery exposed. That's not covered with dura. And recent literature says that to reverse blindness, you may have to do it in the first 12 to 15 minutes, not it. And again, we had that. Interestingly, this doctor, who's from Argentina, had sort of got involved with it as well. And as faith would have it, just after we said that, he had a patient who was going blind, 
during a procedure that he was doing. And he was using a cannula, and within a short period of time, um, the patient had gone pain in the right eye, had uh, developed blindness, and he put 3,000 units of the supraorbital foramen, and um, he also used some methyl prednisolone. I don't, I, I, I've disagreed him slightly on that, but anyway, on day four, the patient began to count fingers. Day five, they started coming around, and their sight was almost fully restored around day eight to 10. And then uh, on day 14, he had almost 100% vision. So I think at that stage, he was the fifth case that had been restored. I gave a talk in St. Petersburg, and there was two Chinese doctors that had reversed some there as well. That was me doing a bit of marketing. He had one of my books. <laughs> now, this is an interesting um, doctor here, and he's in Hanoi in Vietnam, and he was with us as well at the conf. He works in the University Hospital in Hanoi, and what he had done was he had cannulated through the internal carotid artery and back up, and he had um, done MRIs, and he had reversed three at least of his six patients, and um, within a few weeks. How am I doing time-wise? Not too bad. Yeah. Uh, I'm racing through it. I'm not late. But we think that probably it can go across the walls of the artery. There's schools of thought that say one thing, and some of his um, patients, and he quite kindly allowed me to use some of his ones. And that's us, including one of your colleagues in Paris recently. So that's my lecture. Thank you. Patrick, thank you very much. We're going to leave questions till the end, but just to